verses 2 through 9. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Here ends the reading of the gospel. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Good Shepherd. Rich and I are here, and we are excited to bring you the message this morning. Um, we've been, this summer, exploring how do we love well in a divided world. And today, we're going to specifically look at how do we love well in marriage relationships when the Lord has told us to submit to his lordship, the lordship of Jesus. Uh, we're specifically, specifically going to look at um, what he tells us in Genesis and in the Ephesians te uh, text. As we begin, Rich and I want to acknowledge that some of the things that are read and some of the things we're going to say today are hard to hear. They're hard to hear not because we don't believe they came from God. They're hard to hear because um, sometimes we're rebellious and we don't like to hear things um, like submit your will to somebody else. But these passages are very clear um, about what God expects from us. Although they're not politically correct, and even some Christians are embarrassed by them and dismiss them, they are things that God wants us that, to uh, live our lives by. Uh, and we also want to admit that sometimes when we hear words like submit and rule over, they can really be trigger words, especially for people who have been abused by folks in their life that were supposed to love them as Christ loved the church, but they didn't. <laughs> also, we, we, oh, I'm really loud. Uh, we'd like, boy. Also, if the, we are single, widowed, or divorced, we may think this sermon today will not be for us. And we are already tuning out, but I encourage you to stay with us because ultimately the Bible, the Bible teaching is about Christ and his relationship with the church. And all of us, single, married, divorced, or widowed, we are all commanded to love others as we love ourselves. So please, let us pray and we'll get started. Dear Father, thank you for calling us to love you with our whole heart, our whole mind, our soul, and our strength. We want to love our neighbors as ourselves. We want to be obedient, to love our spouses through your love and not ours. But all too often we fail in this. So Jesus, this morning we cry out to you, saying to you, begging you, send the Holy Spirit to come and fill us with your love so that we can surrender to the way that you want to transform us by your love inside and out. Holy Spirit, this morning, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive God's truth as you take Rich and I out of your way. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Rich, I just really want to thank you for being up here. And one of the reasons that I've asked him is because uh, the Ephesians 5 text is really significant for Rich and I. That was the text that our pastor used as a backdrop for the counsel that he gave us the night that we were married. Um, and so when this came up, I thought, what better way than to look at it from both perspectives? So, Rich, as we began, um, in the beginning, what was God's plan for society and families and specifically the marriage relationship? Well, uh, <clears throat> boy. I'm going to step back. <laughs> As we read earlier, that was read earlier, God, uh, God made Adam, and, but he put him in a position of leadership. In, in Genesis, we read about this, and he told him to tend the garden, to name the animals, spread, and spread God's goodness throughout the whole the garden. Knowing it was not good for Adam, 
to be alone. He needed someone to help. He took one of Adam's ribs and made a woman for Adam and named her Eve. Now this began the problems in the world. <laughs> when we have a man and a woman. And certainly God made them different. Um, God, but God told Adam and Eve it was for this reason the man should leave his mother and father and be united to his wife and they would become one flesh. This was God's standard, his purpose and directive for marriage. It wasn't half-heartedly thought, you know, he'd mm -hmm. thought through this. And this was the way it's supposed to be. And we're all, you know, and we'll talk about sin a little bit later, but mm -hmm. how we mess things up. Right. And in God's standard and directive for marriage, I want to be very clear. God may have made Adam first, and he may have made Eve second, but he did not make her less than Adam. They are equal in God's eyes, equal in dignity before God because we were both male and female made in God's image, equal in redemption because Christ died for both men and women. He has redeemed both of us by his death and resurrection. So Rich, if this was God's plan, what went wrong? Well. We find the story of what went wrong in Genesis chapter 3, in a very familiar text, that when the serpent came and deceived Eve, she listened to the serpent rather to, than to God. And we often, you know, it's, it's a, a dialogue between Eve and the serpent, but we kind of wonder, well, where, what's Adam doing? I've wondered that a time or two. <laughs> Well, what he wasn't doing, and uh, he didn't protect her. He didn't intervene. He didn't tell the serpent or kick the serpent or whatever to, and get him to get, go away. Um, he, he should have been protecting her like, you know, he was supposed to be. And instead of fulfilling his responsibility to lead and protect her, he was just standing around and doing nothing. He was not keeping her safe. And as a result of this, in their rebellion, he, and he was rebellious as well, not just, he wasn't just passive, but he was rebellious. And this has played out in the catastrophe of destruction filled with sin and evil, which, brought, which was brought against God's creation. Mm -hmm. So in the verses that were read just a little bit ago, we hear God's um, answer and consequences that he laid out because of the sin, the sins of Adam and Eve. And I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with the text, and I'm going to paraphrase here, so just hang in there with me. Because it was as if God said, okay, here it is, folks. This is the way it's going to be from now on. To Eve and to all of the wives that came after her, it was as if God said, because you usurped your position and you put yourself as leader and ruler over your husband, you're going to have extremely painful childbirth. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> your desire is going to be for your husband. And there are some translations that actually say your desire is going to be contrary to your husband. And just ask Rich. <laughs> That's often the case with us. Um, basically, God was saying to women, because of Eve's sin, you will no longer willfully and joyfully submit to your husband out of obedience to God. Instead, like Eve, you are going to continually try to assert your leadership over him, and you will not recognize his direction at times. God told us that not only would our desire be for our husbands, but they will rule over us. Ouch. <laughs> I told you some of the things that we were going to say today were going to be hard to hear. They're hard to hear, but they're very clear. God said our husbands have leadership in our homes, and that leadership is over us. However, because of the fall, whether our husbands rule over us and how they use their leadership position, if that the way that they're supposed to, whether it's done out of loving us as Christ loved the church or whether they rule over us out of their own selfish ambition 
or their desire to dominate us for their own pleasure, well, that's going to be a choice that they make. And unfortunately for us wives, we know that our husbands are as broken by their sin as we are broken by our sin. And there are many times when our husbands step back into their old Adam and we step back into our old Eve, and that is when problems arise. Yeah, the men are always the problem. Anyway, well guys, because we failed in the garden, and I put that at universal, we failed, God said to Adam and to all of us who came after him, okay, from now on, this is the way it's gonna be. Because you listened to Eve, and not to me, and you sinned, and you rebelled against me, from now on you'll eat your food through painful toil all the days of your life. And whether your wife is submissive, as I have commanded her to be, or whether she is annoying, sometimes, like a dripping faucet that drives you crazy, that, that is up to her. For her desire may be for you, but may all, also may be contrary to your leadership. Yep. So dear, is there any hope for marriage? Yes, actually there is. And the answer is God. You know, in the Garden of Eden, after he had laid out the consequences, God also laid out the plan for hope. He never leaves us without hope. And so he said that in his uh, perfect timing, one of Eve's offspring would come. And when he did, he would crush the head of the serpent. He would defeat sin and death and evil. And so in God's perfect timing, he kept that promise, didn't he? Yes, to he did. To send his son. I know, I stepped over your part. <laughs> So he sent his son and Jesus came and he, he obeyed where Adam failed. He was submissive where Eve rebelled. Mm -hmm. You know, God had a plan all the way, all the, the whole time. Right. And fortunately for us, you know, he, and he fulfilled that plan. The fall had brought devastation and destruction and brokenness to God's creation. But in Jesus, God renewed and repaired all that sin had broken. Mm -hmm. And so marriages can only, only be successful if they are lived out according to God's plan, if they are lived out Christ-centered, where Christ is the middle and he is the one that binds us together. Paul paints a beautiful picture of what a successful Christ-centered marriage looks like. And in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, he really challenges us. Actually, it starts in, in 3 and 4, but throughout chapters 3 through 5, he really challenges us to think about what Christ-centered lives look like. He challenges us to take off our old selves and put on the new self that Christ gives us through his, his love. And when we do that, when we are obedient to that, we exchange our lives for God's truth, our anger for God's peace. We give up gossip, and instead we go and we encourage. Instead of seeking revenge, we seek forgiveness. Instead of living lives of promiscuity, we live lives of self-control. Instead of being under the influence of the world in drunkenness and all kinds of addictions and brokenness, we live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And it is under the influence of the Holy Spirit that we are compelled to put ourselves beneath others, especially our wives, mm -hmm. and to make them more important than ourselves. This is especially true in a Christ-centered marriage where wives follow Jesus and we are called to sub submit and to respect our husbands and to allow them to be responsible for us. And through the power of Christ, we're able to do that. And it may just sound, the men have it all, have everything great, right? But in the same way husbands are, we are called to love our wives and, and use our responsibility for her and to lay down our self, selfishness and our self-agenda so we can prioritize our wives' well-being above our own. We are called to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And that's 
a very high standard mm -hmm. because we know Christ gave up his life for the church. And Paul tells us that this kind of marriage reenacts the gospel story. When we live our lives in a Christ-centered marriage, the husband's action actually mimics that of Christ Jesus, who loved through a self-sacrificial love. And when we are in Christ-centered marriages, the actions of wives mimic that of the church, which allows Jesus to come and to love her and to make her new through his love. The Bible helps us understand that God's design for marriage was to be a lifelong union, one man and one woman, and God did this for the welfare of humanity, even knowing that there would be times when we would mess it all up. And uh, as the gospel says, Moses, God allowed divorce because of our brokenness, but that was never God's plan. It was always to be a lifelong union, one man, one has one man, man one woman. One woman. <laughs> yes, that way. <laughs> And we, we can look at our own society today and, and see what sin has caused in marriages. Mm -hmm. You can see it, in, you know, on TV and our, our neighbors and look in your own homes. Yeah. But throughout history, societies have been the strongest when a marriage bond is held in honor, as, just as God had intended it. And Christ-centered marriages have been the most successful when they are lived out according to this pattern and plan. Mm -hmm. Not by our own pattern, not by my plan. Things, right. my plans always seem to be to fall apart. <clears throat> but if we follow the plan of God, then our marriages will be strong and, is, and these are only made possible through Jesus. Yeah. So let's cut to the chase, should we? If we are honest with ourselves and we're honest with God, we have to admit that being in a marriage relationship is hard. It's a day-to-day -day struggle. It's a struggle of Rich's will against my will and my will against his. Uh, and it's a struggle of my attempt to be in leadership over you. And, and there are times when you just do the yes, dear thing. <laughs> uh, it's a, it, you know, um, but in those times, I also want you to know that the marriage relationship can be the highest of highs as well. There are times when I, I look at Rich and he looks at me with love in his eyes that I have never been able to experience anywhere else in the world. And it just melts my heart when he looks at me that way. But it, when the bad times come, when the hard times come, we are so blessed to be able to cry out to God in desperation, send your Holy Spirit Come and breathe your breath of life into our lungs in, and into our brokenness. And then, only then, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes, is it possible for us to love each other the way that God intended, both in good times and in bad. Well, dear, <laughs> what does it really look like for wives to live out God's directive? Well, I'll tell you, it isn't easy. <laughs> But every day we strive to submit to our husbands. And we do it not because of ourselves, but we do it out of reverence and obedience to Christ. Um, that means that our submission to, to our husbands is to obey the will of God. And we do it in such a way that it's an active willingness to love our husbands out of God's love. Also, God tells us to submit to our husbands in everything. And he's not suggesting some kind of blind obedience here, especially when our husbands <laughs> will ask us to do things out of their own selfishness or out of their, their own pleasure, and it's not really things that are ordained from God. So husbands, I really want to encourage you today to think seriously about what you're asking your wife to do because first and foremost, her love and her obedience is to God first and to you second. So please, don't make us choose between our duty to God and our duty to you. Wives, 
remember that our submission should be done voluntarily and it should be done joyfully, not begrudgingly. I'll tell you, unfortunately, <laughs> Rich married a very strong-willed woman. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and often I get filled with my own sinful pride and I do at times try to usurp his leadership instead of lovingly and respectfully submitting to him and trusting that he's being guided by the Holy Spirit to direct our family and to direct our marriage especially. Um, he's not doing it out of his will, but he's doing it out of God's wisdom and not his own. There have been, like I said earlier, this text in Ephesians 5 is really important to both of us. There have been many times when um, the Holy Spirit has just grabbed me in my sinfulness, and I find myself on my knees reading these passages, praying these passages, begging God, help me to be obedient in the way that you want me to be. Help me to love Rich and respect Rich the way that you want me to, um, so that our interactions as a married couple can glorify God and, and not be out of selfish pride and things. So Rich, what does it really look like for husbands to love their wives as God loved, as Christ loved the church? Well, now we're back to us. Yes. Well, husbands, it's not always easy. And ever since uh, Adam sinned, our, our pride and stubbornness and our wives' flaws, between those, we often fail. However, there's hope. Yep. If we are striving to have a Christ-centered marriage, we're, we're working to be that, mm -hmm. have Christ as the, as the cornerstone of our marriage. Then our relationships with our wives, we should mimic Christ's love for the church. And, but it isn't just our role. Is Our role is not just not limited to making sure that it, our wife is physically and emotionally sustained, like for you know, putting food on the table, a roof over their heads. But our real objective is to make sure our lovely, beautiful wife that we love more than ourselves, that they are prepared to meet Jesus the day when she dies. That's our, that's our role. And I will tell you that, in fact, that's exactly what Rich did for me. You see, when I first met him, I wasn't a Christian, and I didn't know Jesus. But Rich shared his faith with me, and he lovingly introduced me to the biblical Jesus. And he worked hard over an 18-month period of time to walk me to the cross, to help me find God, and to help me understand what God's grace was all about. And boy, was that a wonderful moment when he stood beside me. On, my, on the day that I was baptized, and uh, he was my baptismal sponsor. And this was even before we knew we were going to get married. So husbands, take this really serious. It's vital to take that role and that responsible of preparing your wives um, serious. I don't know about you or how you feel about your wife, but I can't imagine spending eternity without her. <laughs> So, Rich, what kind of love is Paul talking about here? Well, now we're getting to... The Greek. <laughs> Pastor Jeff's and Pastor James's uh, realm. But anyway, the Greek word Paul uses in this text for love is agape, which is a God, it is God's divine, eternal, self-sacrificing love. It's a good thing God gives husbands agape love for their wives, because the great temptation for us, and for me, <laughs> under the skies of, well, I'm just giving leadership, so I can, tell her what any, I can tell her what to do. Or I become bossy, or judgmental, cruel, mm -hmm. selfish, domineering, or abdicating our role of leadership altogether. And soon, like, loves when I say, yes, dear, <laughs> yes, dear. Paul is telling us we are not to focus on what we are getting from our wives. That's not this kind of love. That's not what. That's not the the 
way marriages are supposed to be, but it's supposed to be what we are giving her. And this agape love is not about what husband is due or deserves that you might think you do are due or you might think you deserve, but rather what we owe our wives. It is not about self-satisfaction, but it is about giving up yourself for the satisfaction of others. And this type of love is embodied in Christ's love for the church. Mm -hmm. This type of love, and you may under, recognize this, is this kind of love is patient and kind and not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. This love is divine love given to us from the very heart of God. A love that always protects, mm -hmm. trusts, always hopes, also always perseveres. It's a love, and this love never fails. Gentlemen, we as wives understand, and women of the church, we understand how high a standard this is that God set for you. But this is a safeguard, actually, from God that Christ is giving to you to protect our well-being and our dignity. Um, because when we commit to you in marriage, in effect, what we are saying is, okay, this is God's way. And with God's help, I will submit myself to God's way. But how about you, husband? <laughs> will you love me as Christ commands you to love me? With all my heart. <laughs> In a, as soon as Susan and many of you may know, I'm a country music fan. And when I think of loving Susan, I always or often think of the words of a song by Garth Brooks, if tomorrow never comes. Because there are times when I am lying awake and watching her sleep, the songs come to me, and as the song says, and the thought crosses my mind, if I never wake up in the morning, would she ever doubt the way I feel about her in my heart? If tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I love her? Did I try in every way to show her every day that she's my only one. And if my time on earth, for, earth were through and she had to face the world without me, is the love I gave her in the past going to be enough to last if tomorrow never comes? So husbands, do you love your wives? Do you love your wife with God's agape, self-sacrificial type of love? Not are you just fond of your wife. Not just you are friends with your wife. Do you agape her? Not just with an erotic, selfish, carnal love. But with a divine, God-given, God-ordained love for her alone. Mm -hmm. And finally, husbands, do your wives know how much you, they, you love them? have to follow that. <laughs> yes, being married is hard at times, and it takes deliberate work to stay emotionally and spiritually and physically connected to our spouses. This hasn't always been easy for Rich and I, and we really struggled through this, especially in those years when I was in seminary. Uh, four and a half years of me traveling back and forth and being gone for months at a time. There was one summer when he couldn't get away from work to come and visit me, and, and I was six hours from him, and I couldn't come because of my studies. I couldn't get to him. And by the end of the summer, I could really tell that we were disconnecting in a lot of different ways. So I asked him to plan a motorcycle trip for us, really hoping that if we went on this trip and spent time together, we could get back on track. I know, this is <laughs> just before I came home. Um, I heard the words to the song, Bind Us Together, Lord. Uh, through my tears, I just felt the Holy Spirit urging me to have Rich sing that song every morning before we began our day trip. And he agreed. So we would sit on the, on the edge of the bed and we would sing, Bind Us Together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. 
Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Soon this song became our prayer, the prayers of our hearts for one another and for God. And by the end of the trip, the Holy Spirit really had indeed knit our hearts back together with God's love. Marriage is hard, but it's also rewarding. As I said earlier, it's, sometimes it's a day-to-day, moment-by-moment commitment to God and to each other. So as we close today, Rich and I want to encourage you in your marriage. Remember, every marriage is made up of two broken sinners crying out to Jesus, come and help us forgive each other, help us forget the pain and brokenness that we've caused. And remember that it's in the good times and the bad that Jesus comes. He comes to help us as wives to submit to our husbands. And he comes and helps husbands love their wives as he loved the church. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we ask that you would, I ask that you would forgive me for all of the times when I hurt this precious man that you've given to me to love. And I ask that you would forgive your daughters for all of the times that we hurt our husbands. Help us to be obedient to you and to submit to them voluntarily, joyfully, and in reverence to you, Christ Jesus. Help us respect them. Help us to lift them up in prayer often. And help us love them through your divine love and not our broken, sin-filled love. And Jesus, forgive me. Forgive the times that I sin against Susan. And I ask that you would forgive the son, your sons for the hurt that we have caused our wives with words and actions and the pain we have inflicted because of our brokenness and our stubbornness and our selfishness. Help us love our wives as you, Christ Jesus, have loved the church. Jesus, protect us with your love when Satan continues to come to kill, steal, and destroy our marriages and families. We pray this all in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.